Hi, everyone, and welcome again to Don't Blame the CRM podcast series. In this, in this podcast, um, as always, we talk about revenue operations, sales operations, and strategy, and often in the context of B2B SaaS. Today, we have an awesome guest. We have Navid Pamra from a company called Lacework. Welcome to the show, Navid. Oh, thank you, Miko. Nice to be here. Excellent. Uh, First of all, it would be nice to hear a little bit about your background. You have been in the ops space quite some time, also seen a few different companies, both sort of high uh, growth companies, but also very large enterprises. Could you briefly talk about your background in, in the ops world? Sure. So um, I'm currently at Lacework. So uh, I've been at Lacework now for the last almost 18 months. Um, So Lacework is a cloud security platform uh, based on uh, the data and um, is hosted in the cloud uh, as a SaaS product. Um, So we're experiencing growth there as an organization. Uh, We started in EMEA uh, last year uh, from scratch and we're continuing to build the business here. Let's talk about trends in in ops both in sales ops and revenue ops i feel maybe 10 years ago uh, not tons of companies discussed sales ops or revenue ops maybe they didn't even have a team or that type of role nowadays especially us based companies many of them have rev ops teams and then in europe uh, Companies have sales ops, maybe marketing ops, CS ops, and they're putting them under one umbrella. But what are the, some of the trends you have seen during the past 10 years or so in the in the world of ops? Like, is there certain things that are becoming more and more important? And, and how is the role of ops uh, changing these days? Sure. So, you know, kind of racking my brains. I think I, from my experience, at least in other organizations, I've always seen those functions, whether it's partner ops, marketing ops, sales ops, um, um, even CS ops, which is now becoming a really important part. Um, They've always kind of, not in silo, but they've operated separately. The things that I've tended to see is that's always really been dependent upon management, how management want to run their organizations. Do the organizations fall under one umbrella? So for example, I've seen uh, the revenue ops remit under a head of um, or president of, of sales who owns the whole pre to post sales uh, prospect and then everything that involves supporting sales, whether it's marketing and channel. I've also seen that revenue f- ops function also then gets split out depending on who the leadership is. So a certain cohort will remain together, such as CS and partner and sales and then marketing would form its own function under uh you know the the cmo for example i think there's benefits to both i think benefits around having it under one umbrella means that processes approach uh the way that you do things the way you think about things the way you plan is a lot more consistent and it's not one is over here and one is down here um so i do see a lot of merit to that um But then I also think having sometimes that understanding of how each function operates and what is important to each function is also very different. And finding people that have that whole skill set is very, very difficult. I think right now, um, maybe based on the last 10 years. But my prediction is, is I think as the new up and coming leaders um, uh, join organizations i think they're getting a better grip of all the gamut of what these functions do and so i wouldn't be surprised if we start to see more of a focus on revenue operations maybe in the next 10 years many many things that go under ops umbrella i mean we can talk about processes and playbooks there's data and insights and there's obviously enablement people technology uh, if we start with data and insights i would imagine that uh, Lacework is a very data-driven company, given that you provide also services for companies that are using Azure and Google Cloud and ABS. But is, is data and insights, is that like one of the key focus areas for you when you work in ops and uh, you try to help the organization to meet the growth goals? Like what, what type of data and insights related projects and initiatives you're working on, for example, at this, at this moment? 
that, that's kind of the core backbone of, of, of what I enjoy and what I do. And I think where a lot of value can be added back into the business. So for example, one of the things I've worked on recently is looking at um, our pipeline and looking at how we're tracking in our pipeline, but taking a very different view to maybe how we've been doing it previously within the company. And so uh, one of the initiatives I took with my sales leadership team here in EMEA was to look at um, how are we doing on a weekly basis and how much pipeline are we adding and who's creating the pipeline and how much are they creating? And, and are we seeing the levels of activity that we expect? And if we don't, then how do we course correct? But we then went one step further and started looking at, well, okay, we're generating pipeline, brilliant. But what does that even mean? Is it good, bad, or ugly? You know, without numbers or targets, it, it's all, it, it doesn't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so we then started looking at things such as coverage. So do we have enough pipeline going into the current quarter and the next quarter? And do we have the coverage levels that we need in order to be successful? Um, so that was another metric that we then created within this um, reporting metrics pack. And then the last piece was around forecasts. So <clears throat> we have a forecast tool. Um, so we could then see, OK, well, if this individual is forecasting X and they have coverage of y and z and they have activity of you know aa um <clears throat> how are they tracking and what became really interesting as we kind of dug into the insights is we had people that were maybe not generating any activity in terms of building pipeline they maybe had some level of reasonable coverage um but they were going to absolutely blow their number out in terms of their forecast and so <clears throat> what we started to surmise together uh, or at least with my leaders was um, this person is very much focused on closing this deal for the quarter, but mm. they're not looking three months out. And once that deal closes, that three months is going to come straight up and hit them on the face. So how do we get this person to start thinking about running their business on a six month or longer basis? Yep. This data set was very useful to allow sales leadership to kind of focus on certain areas for their people, because a lot of the, things that may need to be fixed are not the same for everyone within a team. So if we can focus them on specific areas for specific individuals, then the messaging becomes a lot more tailored. Yep. Uh, at Vino, we when it comes to data and insights, uh, we often talk about ideal customer profile. Uh, just out of curiosity, who owns the ideal customer profile definition at Lacework? Is it ops? Is it like founders or sales leadership? <laughs> all these people uh, together like who owns the icp definition and and um, also what is the icp how, how do you define it at the moment what type of companies are ideal customers for lace work sure so the icp is actually owned by uh, operations uh, revenue operations sales operations um, we look to refresh that maybe on a by annual basis or an annual basis. We often get a lot of input from sales leadership, but more often than not from technical leadership, uh, because obviously they understand the product, they understand the competition out there, they understand maybe where we're winning, maybe where we're not winning, and um, what we might be coming up against, um, and obviously <coughs> developments in the marketplace. But it's predominantly owned by the, the, the sales operations, revenue operations team. Um, and we're the ones that have the categorization. And then obviously we apply that categorization into the CRM. And um, for us, um, you know, companies that are cloud native or in the cloud or built on the cloud are really kind of the sweet spot for us. We also look at um, companies that um, have evidence of um, obviously a cloud footprint, but also evidence of other tools that we come into or play into. Um, and also information around funding which is publicly available information mm -hmm. so if they are getting funded or they are growing the amount of funding they're getting then it's more than likely as they get to a certain level size or scale they'll need some form of security posture yep. i would imagine i mean at least uh, on your website you talk about a few specific industries uh, fintech health tech also gaming uh, do you does ops 
team provide the list of ideal customers for salespeople? Like, because you know that they need to be cloud native. Uh, you can also, I guess, track some of the maybe job openings these companies are posting whenever they look for a cloud security officer that might be a good timing or recent funding round. But you, you also know the ones that are in the gaming sector. Like, can salespeople just prospect and, and pick and choose any company they want? Or is that centralized? Does ops team actually provide that these are the type of companies we want to go after? Here's the list. Try to make some progress. Um, yes and no. So I think at the beginning of the year, uh, everyone will get a specified territory. Yep. Uh, and in that territory, we look to try and balance um, the ideal customer profile evenly where possible across the teams. Um, and then <clears throat> the expectation then is for the teams then to kind of prioritize their accounts uh, and, and focus on maybe the higher propensity ones and, and, and look to focus on those. Uh, some of those may be a subset of some of those industries, um, fintech, uh, gaming, healthcare, et cetera. Some may not be. Um, and so that's kind of how we we kind of point our people to go to market in, in, in that way and in that function. Um, sometimes, depending on where we do have success, we may then also go back to the teams and say, look, maybe look at your territory and see if you've got any of these type of accounts because we're having success and you may be able to have the same level of success uh, based on this use case or based on this customer story. Mm. So it kind of it's kind of cyclical depending on where we are in the year, uh, where we're having success. Makes, makes sense. And then I've been always asking from ops people and I, I fear that there are almost two different, um, two different segments. Like where do you have your sort of master data or source of truth regarding customers? Some, some ops teams, they, they have a clearly made a decision that their own CRM it might be Salesforce, it might be HubSpot, that that's the place and that's where the source of truth is. But then also some teams are building their own cloud data warehouses, data lakes, often called as customer data platforms. How, how do you approach that? Like, do you have a separate uh, cloud data warehouse where you have all the customer data and information about existing customers and prospects, or do you use CRM for that, that that's the place where uh, all the data is, is, is collected? Um, for now, all our data is being collected in the CRM. Yep. Uh, from what I'm aware of, uh, or at least that's where I get go and get all the information. I haven't been told otherwise. So we're using our CRM as that source. We do sometimes do uh, analysis uh, on other tools such as Tableau, um, just because of the sensitivity around numbers on, 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 on plans and quotas, et cetera, which sometimes you can't always easily put into, into the CRM. So really more of a user interface sit on top of the CRM is kind of the way that we use Tableau. Uh, but predominantly, we've made sure that everything sits in the CRM, and I don't think we've really... Uh, diverge from that too much so for now i think we're in a good place but who knows what the future holds exactly uh, let's let's talk about like people and sort of the skills uh, you need to be successful in ops uh, i feel that quite a few companies when they first establish sales ops they often pick somebody from the sales team maybe an AE or successful team lead or sales director has been very good at using CRM and uh, sort of very systemized and uh, or having a systematic approach and very structured in his or her work. But I feel that nowadays there's also a lot more variety uh, in, in that, that there's people who have finance background, we have people who have background in data and analytics. Like what, what, what do you need? Uh, what, what do you think? What is an ideal background and uh, what type of people you think uh, should consider revenue ops and sales ops and ops in general as a, as a potential next career move? Do you have to have sales background to be successful? What are your thoughts? So I don't necessarily think you do, but I think you have to 
put yourself in their shoes to understand what it is that they do on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis. I think one of the things I was always taught by a previous sales leader was um, don't throw stones <laughs> uh, at, the, at the teams, but actually get in the trenches with them and understand what it is that they're doing, going through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think once you do that, I think you start unlocking a lot of understanding around what it takes, what it takes to be a salesperson and where you can actually add value. So I think understanding the whole sales culture, the process, et cetera, is really, really important. Um, and I think that's the key fundamentals. That also then allows you to build relationships as well within the organization. It also allows you to build relationships with sales. They are ultimately one of your biggest end customers. And so if you can't do that and you can't build that relationship with them and have that two-way relationship, you're probably limiting yourself in being able to do maybe a um, sales operation, sales facing role. Mm -hmm. um, which I actually find to be the most exciting and the most fun part of sales operations. But it also isn't for everyone. So, you know, the constant back and forth, the, the, the you know, times of negotiating during planning, making the hard decisions, making hard decisions on segmentation, making hard decisions on planning numbers, growth. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a certain type of person and, um, you know, you need to be very good also at negotiating and providing points of view and using data, et cetera. So I think that type of role takes a very specific skill set of individual, can be taught in my humble opinion. But I also think you have to have a very thick skin as well, because sometimes things will work, sometimes things won't. There's a lot of kind of centralized, almost back-end function type roles within sales operations that can also work for you. Um, um, so I don't really think... Um, background is that relevant um i think just having a hunger and want and need to learn i think is very important especially in these fast moving organizations you know an ex cro always said to me you need to have that level of intellectual curiosity and trying to understand maybe why something works and something doesn't and kind of go through those different paths but um yeah i think there needs to be some level of technical aptitude for sure uh, being able to use the systems, being able to teach yourself how to use the systems is also very, very important. Commercial piece can be taught, uh, but that's also really important. So, for example, if you're building a compensation plan, technically, you've got to be very good at finance accounting to an extent. But you've also got to understand from a commercial perspective, is this really going to drive my revenue or is this really going to work for sales or how do I make this a better incentive for sales in order to go and drive the revenue that I need? So. I think you need to balance both the technical skill aptitude piece, but also kind of the commercial understanding of uh, what maybe drives the revenue, what drives the salesperson and how you interact with those. But um, I also look at other things. It's not just about their background. I also look at, you know, uh, what they've done in the past, what their hobbies might, might be outside of work. Have there been times where they've had to go through difficult times, whether it's both personal or at work um, because in these high growth environments things are never always perfect mm. and things change very quickly yep. uh, you need a lot of grit and determination but also you need a lot of persistence and you know you have to go through several cycles sometimes to get the right outcome and if people haven't experienced or gone through that whether it's in their own lives or uh, at work um, they could fail at the first hurdle so yeah, this, I think the technical piece is often given. I think it's the ability and the attitude and the willing to, willingness to learn, but also have they gone through the tough times? Because building an organization is not easy. Um, mm. And it's very different to walking into, you know, an organization like Salesforce or a Microsoft that has probably gone through a lot of that cycle versus actually having to build it yourself. And let's let's also talk about metrics. You mentioned also compensation, uh, which is which is interesting. Uh, but do you think ops teams should have their own KPIs and metrics, or do you feel that it's the company objectives and key results, and then 
sales ops following sales KPIs and metrics? Or do you think that ops team needs their own metrics or is it mainly the company objectives and KPIs that they should, they should follow? Following those metrics are important. Obviously, we need to translate those metrics down to what it is that we do on a daily basis to see how they can be driven. But I wouldn't be adverse to your point around having maybe one or two additional metrics that are specific to what we do or uh, metrics that could be used to improve what we do on top of the metrics that are coming from the company. Um, so I'm kind of on that line with you that I think revenue operations should and could have their own metrics, but maybe not too many, because I think the other thing I'm a firm believer of is having too many metrics also doesn't drive the focus that's required in what, what it is that you need to do and achieve. If there's enough metrics from top down, great, maybe you don't need to add any more. If there isn't, then maybe the odd metric here or there from uh, within the team is also very important just to drive what it is that we need to do as a team. And then salespeople obviously often have a uh, performance-based component in their comp plan. Do you think ops people should have also a performance-based component or do you feel that it's it's a little bit different type of role and, and it should be just base salary and, and that's it and not performance-based component to get yeah. their OTE? Um, that's an interesting one. So I've seen both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it ends up becoming just based on cost, cost and margins. So I think as you have more people on the OTE component piece, obviously your cost base is going to go up. And so what I've seen is it maybe transitions from a OTE based compensation plan to more of a bonus plan. Um, but I think you know, based on the work that ops do and some of the decisions and the segmentation decisions that they make and optimization of the business and driving the business, I wouldn't be adverse to <clears throat> having an OTE component permanently. Mm. Um, but I think it really depends on the organization, how the CFO is thinking about things, how the CRO is thinking about things. And then I know that we have lots of people in the in the in the audience who also build products and services that are designed to revenue ops and sales ops um, what would be your tip i would imagine that you also get approached by lots of different vendors like what would be the ideal way to sell services and products to sales ops and ops and revenue ops people like do you need to sort of message and, and approach those cases differently compared to more traditional buying centers such as VP sales, VP marketing? Do you feel that maybe the buyers are more informed in the ops roles? Is there any, 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 any tips that you can give for people who are selling services and products for ops? <clears throat> yeah, I think aim to understand what makes up a revenue op operations organization. So what are the elements of mm -hmm. revenue operations, right? Whether it's uh, CRM, whether it's uh, CS, whether it's partner operations, what are the elements that make that up? Um, what are the systems they may be using? Um, <clears throat> same with comp, you know, uh, how, do you how do you administer compensation? How do you administer compensation plans? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we spoke a lot in this podcast around data. So aim to try and understand if you were to build an ICP model or you were to enrich your data, uh, what are the elements that are important in order to enrich that? And, um, uh, you know, how would you do it? How can your tool help do that? Mm. And I think understanding the elements of how a revenue operations function works is probably a key differentiator if people out there can do that and understand what are the specific use cases for those specific elements of a revenue operations organization and then really look to target those in a very specific manner um, and take it from there. So for example, <clears throat> you know, um, a team might need a new data vendor to enrich its data. Mm. Uh, that's a conversation around, well, how are you enriching the data? Where is it being enriched? What data elements do you need? Why do you need the data? Mm. Uh, what are you going to do with the data? Um, so 
that's an element of CRM and, and how we want to go to market. So I think understanding those elements, verticals, I think would be my advice on getting a much more specific, tailored messaging um, to whether it's someone like me or someone in HQ. The other thing I would also say is more often than not, uh, a lot of these buying decisions happen in HQ, especially with much uh, less mature organizations, but even organizations that are at the 5,000 plus yep. level. So <laughs> coming to me is great, but I'm not ultimately going to be the decision maker. So I think that's the other piece of advice I would give. A lot of these decisions continuously happen in the US if it's a US-based company and not in the specific regions. And then final question. Um, for salespeople and marketing people, there's plenty of communities and blog posts and, and um, sort of sources of information to educate themselves. How about ops people? Like, do you have go-to places, maybe a, I don't know, a blog or a certain community? Like, how do you educate yourself? How do you uh, keep up with uh, the recent developments? So <clears throat> I've seen some really good stuff on Pavilion. Um, not that I'm signed up, but they've done some very good podcasts. Uh, there was one very, very good one um, that I actually referred to a lot, which was done with the team at Salonis. Uh, and those people are revered in the industry. Uh, mm. They basically built up the international business at Salesforce. Uh, with a very repeatable model. Um, and they kind of walk through that on how they've done that. Um, uh, so that's one. Um, there's a couple of other communities I've seen. Uh, one is, uh, I think it's uh, uh, RevOps or Wizards of RevOps. Uh, there's also another one called Rev Genius as well. Uh, I must admit, I haven't spent enough time on those, but those are two communities that kind of integrate themselves through Slack. Mm -hmm. um, so those are very, very good ones. Um, <clears throat> you will often get the odd rev ops person on podcasts like Sastra, uh, mm -hmm. which is a good one um, as well. Um, I tend to read a lot more and listen more just generally on what's happening in the marketplace in what we do and then kind of translate that down to what we do on a daily basis. Um, and then the final one is, <clears throat> you know, I have quite a few people that I've either worked with in the past or <clears throat> are in the same industry. And so, you know, often we will, um, you know, have general conversations around, you know, where the state of things are, um, things they um, are thinking about or things that are top of mind for them. So I think the human interaction piece with people in the industry as well is also an important one as well. Excellent. And thank you so much for being part of the being part of the show, Nabiet. This was excellent. Thank you so much.